How can you give back? How do you fit into the rest of the world? How can the skills you've gathered contribute to the greater good? Kit Delorier, we are proud to present to you the highest award in snow sports in America, the Medal of Honor, and confer upon you membership in the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame. She's stubborn. She's flat out stubborn. She knows what she wants and she knows what she needs to do to go get it. So Kit's ski accomplishments, it's a long list. The beginning of Kit's career in skiing started with the U.S. Free Skiing Championship. Free skiing is the idea of skiing natural terrain and using the features in the most creative and technical way possible. She won the world championships. And then she did it again. Overall world tour champion, Kit I won that event. Dick Bass, who was then the owner of Snowbird Ski Resort, was handing out the awards. He was the first person to climb the Seven Summits. In the morning when I went to check out, there was a signed copy of his book, The Seven Summits, waiting for me. I was reading his words and visualizing what these mountains look like, and they seemed all skiable to me. And so that was when I decided that I was gonna try and ski the Seven Summits. Sunny Antarctica. Kit. Kit. Say hi. Hi. She just started knocking off these peaks. Vincent, Denali, Kilimanjaro. So, here I am about to ski from the summit of Kaposius. Go, perfect corn. <laughs> um, in October of 2006, we jumped to Everest. That's definitely the most dangerous thing I've ever skied. Climbing and skiing Mount Everest was probably the most challenging of the seven summits. Good. I mean, you're skiing the highest mountain in the world. with the ski descent from the summit of Everest. I completed my project to be the first person to climb and ski the seven summits. We made it back safely from our ski descent of Everest. and I felt intense confusion about what was next. And I did wonder, would that be my sunset? When I was 10 years old, sitting in the back of my mom's green Volkswagen square back, waiting for up to three hours for a tank of gas during one of the oil crises. And I was reading this newspaper and the story on the front page was about the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It was about the porcupine caribou herd that migrates there and how important those lands were for their birthing grounds. And that juxtaposed with the reality that there's oil under the ground in the Arctic Refuge, and that there are some interests that wanted to drill for that oil. I just felt like this doesn't make any sense. 
There's got to be another solution. Arctic oil and gas is some of the things that keeps me up at night. The Arctic has a global impact on climate. Both poles are there for reason for Earth. They're acting like coolers. And once you start losing that, what we call the cryosphere, anything frozen, snow, frozen ground, glaciers, you're losing the cooling mechanism of Earth. So you get these non-linear effects where temperature goes up in a very quick way. So investing in new oil and gas in Alaska is the last thing we want to do. And the refuge is one of those areas where this is being talked about and it worries me tremendously. Thank you, Connie. I was 37 right after I got off of Everest. And over the next two years, had our two children. There I was with a three-month-old and a 21-month-old, wondering what was next. I wanted to go somewhere that had another level of meaning for me. I decided to go to the Arctic Refuge because I remembered that debate from when I was a 10-year-old and hearing about it. The Arctic has its calling. It draws you in. It's like a primal feeling. It is ancient and wise in these ways that you just don't get to experience very often. So I pulled together a proposal and we went in 2010. Our objectives were to climb and ski the highest mountains in the Brooks Range. That was a huge unknown because one scale says that the highest mountain is Mount Easto, and the other scale says the highest mountain is Mount Chamberlain. That shows up here how little is known and how little is mapped where we're still debating on which mountain is the tallest. On the 2010 first trip, I actually met uh, Dr. Matt Nolan, who's a glaciologist at the time he worked at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Matt Nolan really pioneered ways to map the landscape. They take DSLR cameras, put them in fixed wing airplanes, and you can do this mapping of the landscape at very accurate detail. I asked him, how can I help you? Kit possesses unique skills compared to mortal men in terms of mountaineering and skiing and the ability to haul lots of heavy equipment up steep mountain slopes. Her effort was to scramble up them with the GPS, use the GPS to figure out what the peak elevation was. While I was flying overhead, trying to make the same measurement from the air and compare those two measurements. The data was actually published in a peer-reviewed journal called the Cryosphere. We were able to discern that Mount Easto is the highest, but the surprising thing is, Mount Chamberlain wasn't number two. Mount Hubli is the second highest. I know her trips to Alaska have had a huge impact on her. The National Wildlife Refuge, I know was like really important to her and may even be her reason for existing. After I did that work with Matt Nolan, I realized I could take this high-level skill set that I had built and contribute to some greater understanding of this place, which is important to me. Because on my 2010 trip, as I was skiing across the coastal plain, I was struck with how fragile it feels. I made a personal vow. I'm going to do whatever I can do to protect this place. This is an ABC News special report. 
President Trump has just signed a historic $1.5 trillion tax bill, the president's biggest legislative victory to date. This will be the biggest... In 2017, there were some tax cuts put into place, primarily for corporations and wealthy individuals. And in order to balance those, the administration suggested this Tax and Jobs Act. And in that tax act, there's a mandate to open the coastal plain to oil and gas extraction, calling that that revenue that the federal government would receive would balance the lack of income from the tax cuts. Because of the mandate, the Bureau of Land Management is required to figure out under what conditions can this work take place. Oil and gas activities in Arctic areas traditionally happen in the winter. Ideally, the heavy equipment is traveling over snow. Because the ground is frozen, there is a higher chance of you not digging big scars in the tundra. And so the BLM requires a nine inch minimum of snow coverage across the coastal plain in order to protect the land underneath. I got thinking, I did not see that present in 2010. And then I went back in 2018 and saw what looked like a brown expanse, at least 90% snow less on the coastal plain. I don't believe that there is this nine inch average on the coastal plain. And that's what we went to find out. On this trip, our mission was to climb and ski Mount Hubli, the second highest in the Brooks Range in the US Arctic. The second part of the trip was to ski out onto the coastal plain and do some snow science measurements. When Kit focused on the current trip to Alaska to ski the second highest peak to complete the five highest in the U.S. Arctic, coupled with the science side of it. It's like the next evolution. Ski mountaineering with citizen science. Are you excited, kid? I'm super excited. Yeah. Who are the people on your team? Quick, quick one sentence on each of them. I say on my team. On our team, we had Sophia Schwartz, who has been a great friend of mine ever since we met. I think you can make one out of tape, which is nice too. She was a member of the US ski team as a mogul skier. And Sarah Carpenter. I have long appreciated Sarah's immense knowledge of snow science. She co-owned and ran American Avalanche Institute for well over 10 years. I would just call it a cold north wind. It's really cold right now, so. Jim has been a friend of mine since 2015. He has more experience skiing 8,000 meter peaks than I do. What do you call this kind of snow, Sarah? Junk. Junk. <laughs> Junk snow, that's the scientist, snow scientist terminology. The thing that was underlying this trip that none of us needed to say was that if anything happened in the mountains, we wouldn't be able to get picked up by Dirk. Because in about a week, there would be not enough snow for him to land anywhere within 100 miles. We were on our own. We wouldn't want to get yourself into a situation where you need to get help out that far away. Because you're not going to get help for a long time. I'm 
decidedly better than down there, I think. Okay, here comes two weeks at the Arctic shopping cart. Oh, I'm just grabbing some snow. It's pretty nice, huh? We probably would want to like go through there, boot up here, go to the summit, and come back. So we camped there at Okpelik Lake. And the next day, we skied south, deeper into the mountains, to get closer to Hubli. Okay, I'm trying a little bit more water kit than I did for Sarah. I'm gonna have to find my spoon too. Jim, what are you packing for? Packing for Mount Hubli, ski mission. Kit's last unaccomplished five highest peaks of the Brooks Range. Their shite, but we're there. Right. We got our stuff together. We're gonna go for a little walk. <laughs> Kit just fell down. <laughs> There's a few waterfalls, which I did not expect at all. Where all of a sudden you have like 10 feet of ice that you have to get up. This whole time you have like a 55, 60 pound pack on. The summit looks really rocky. I'd say yet to be determined. We don't really know what the snow is going to be like in the line. We don't. It could possibly go wrong. Let's get, <laughs> Let's get started. Let's get started. The last 10 years, I have skied the first, third, fourth, and fifth highest in the Brooks Range. It made sense to do the second. Getting to see the sun rise as we like crested over the Bravo Glacier was super cool. Good morning. And from there, you start to get eyes on the objective. Where are you doing, Sophia? Where are we at? In the QR, making good time, great, great grandpa. The snow is really firm, which was great for climbing up, but definitely in the back of your mind, you're like, ooh, is it gonna soften at all? for the ski back down. We'll see what's up ahead, but that spot was I, definitely I think depth we core. should just be cognizant of it on the way down and manage it well. The summit was spicy. It was the spiciest of the five. Sorry, what? <laughs> spicy, you don't know spicy summits? You pour a little sriracha. The climbing to get up that last pitch was the most technical of any of the five peaks she skied. I mean, the snow doesn't even go exactly to the top. Oh, look. There's Alaska. So there we were climbing ice, a couple mixed climbing moves. Okay, Kit, you're on belay. Fully climbing to the summit was like super cool to see. Top of Mount Hoobly. Rope. Skiing Hoobly, there's a reason it doesn't get done very often or hasn't been done before. It's incredibly remote. That whole area is low snow. You wouldn't even think that it's possible, but it's possible. We got up to the top. Now we're usually the fun part. Oh, oh.
vegetables. It's like, let's just revel in this for an hour or so. <laughs> and then let's keep moving. Because we still have to get to the coastal plain for our snow science mission. We've got a whole lot of walking to the ocean. <laughs> I think it's gonna be fun. <laughs> this is a good way to like decide you wanna start transitioning to a new sport for summer. Ski from Akpilik Lake to Kaktovik. We knew we had about four days to get to Kaktovik. We're also doing all of the snow science. We get to drop 2,000 vertical feet over 52 miles. It's all downhill from here. It's all downhill. The reason I want to measure the snow is because this is one place the legislation speaks it clearly. You must have these conditions. And I know these conditions aren't being met, but we need to prove it. I wouldn't be surprised if Kit goes up there and finds very barren conditions. If that is true, that means that extractive industries would put big scars into the tundra ecosystem. The tundra has a permafrost underneath it. If a heavy oil industry piece of equipment leaves an imprint in the spring when all the snow melts, groundwater collects in that imprint and it increases the thaw of the permafrost around it. There's enough carbon dioxide stored in permafrost across the Arctic that we could double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from permafrost alone. That's going to result in a world where it's not a viable place for many people and ecosystems to even function or survive. In planning to go out, in my desire to understand the snow out there better, I went to some experts, Dr. Matthew Sturm and Charlie Parr, to learn how to do the snow science to their specifications. Okay, got the magna probe. We were being trained in this GPS-enabled magna probe as opposed to doing manual handheld measurements. The magna probe takes height of snow measurements, so, so depth of snow measurements, um, and it geotags them. So that pointy end is going to go down into the snow. The top end will connect to the backpack, and that's how the electronics in the backpack will talk to this and get the depth of the snow, as well as the GPS location of where that snow is being measured. So I carried this magna probe, and it wasn't light. <laughs> so that basket will ride on top of the snow you surface the when the pole goes in. The magna probe will measure the snow depth to wherever that basket rides on top of the snow. And then that trigger, that's how you actually take the measurement, is pressing that green button. Yep, so that'll take the measurement. Every place that we stop to do these measurement stations, two steps, probe strike, hit the button, record it. There's sort of a diff couple different patterns we do. One pattern is there's a single point that we're really interested in. We'll start at that point and just spiral outwards. This is exactly it. This is what you would call, we call this the death spiral um, <laughs> because you can just keep going and going and going. It's funny to watch Kit just walk around in circles, you know, probing every little bit of time. Meanwhile, Sarah did snow pits and measured snow density and snow water equivalent. We're gonna dig a big pit with the legendary Sarah Carpenter. Snow science is like any science, a complicated science. People think of snow as like, well, is it there or not? 
there's a lot more than just putting a yardstick in the ground and saying it's nine inches or it's two. You worry about snow density, the crystal structure, all sorts of facets. Low density snow doesn't have a lot of water to it. It's more air than water, more air than ice. In general, there's not a lot of water in this snow. There's no cohesion to these crystals. You hold them up in your fingers and they fall through your hand like sugar, like sand. That means that they're never gonna bond to each other and they're never gonna support any weight on top of them. So even if there was a nine inch average, how can it hold the weight of a heavy piece of equipment? There's such a varying amount of snow out there. There's places where the snow was six, eight, 10 inches deep, three inches deep, some places non-existent. At the end of the day, it's not as simple as going out there and measuring snow depth. There's so much more. For the first time in history, we have this congressional mandate to drill in the Arctic Refuge. Inside of that mandate, there are two lease sales that are required. The remarkable thing about that is that so few companies bid on the land. And now we have all the major banks in the US saying that they will not back any loans for oil industry in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And most recently, we have major insurance companies in the US saying that they will not insure any oil and gas extraction activities in the Arctic Refuge. One challenge is to get protection for these enormously important ecosystems that are insensitive to administration changes and cycles. So whether you have Republicans for eight years or Democrats for eight years. That should not alter the protections we have for these wilderness areas. What we still don't have is a reversal of that mandate. And that mandate has to be followed through unless an act of Congress reverses it. It's the last little foot repair. It's beautiful. I'm a little bit sad to be leaving, but you know, stoked to go see the Kektovic Air Troop. Oh. <laughs> it's always been a dream of mine. It's always, been a dream. It's always something to look forward to in Sophia's world. <laughs> We've given our data to the scientists in support of their ongoing work. Hopefully the people in Congress make the right decision going forward. There are issues that we can no longer not face. And these hard choices will define our future. There's a different level of pride that I have as her little brother watching what she's doing now, whereas before it just seemed to be more badges that she was collecting, you know, free skiing tour and all of that. I was like, oh, that's really cool, but to what end? And now it's like, okay, maybe this was the end. It was like the 20s were just figuring out who I was and, and what I wanted to do. And then in my 30s, it was a lot about gaining a level of mastery at that. And you could say that went all the way up to Everest. From my 40s, 
I realize for me it's a lot about how do you fit into the rest of the world. How do you help contribute to some greater understanding of the world around you? I don't know exactly what the future is going to hold, but I'm not done looking for ways to protect this area, be in it, and work on what speaks to my heart. For me, that's what this next phase has been and continues to be.